The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. Uh, you know how it goes. About seven months ago, I, I guess I got an email saying, uh, Ralph, would you be... Uh, would you be willing to give a talk, uh, you know, for the summer national gathering, so on and so forth? And of course, in a weak moment, I said, "Oh, sure, why not?" And <laughs> hit the click and send. Well, about seven minutes later, a uh, message came back saying, "Oh, great! What's the title of your talk going to be?" I got seven months to think about this, and they're asking for it right now. So I kind of toyed around with a few things, and finally sent it back. And I was all I was required was to keep it somewhat close to the nature here of the theme, which is, I'm reading it now because it says, nature, gateway to sacred treasures, not scared treasures, but uh, cl close enough. So I got to thinking about this, <laughs> got to thinking about science, sacred, uh, it was a little scary, of course, uh, ancient wisdom or modern fad. Now, the ancient wisdom has been a, a title that's been around here for some time. And all you have to do is to go back in our history, just go down to the library and start looking at books, talks, papers, and old issues of our journals, and you see that again and again and again. Of course, I'm not telling you anything new. So I started trying to build a talk around this. I've been retired for 10 years, so I don't have a canned talk to reach in and pull out and give. So I, ha I had to make this one up. So I had a little folder, though, that said Science and Theosophy. And I thought, well, I'll just put together a collection of things, and a story should fall out of this. Well, of course, it always, as usual, turned out to be a little more difficult than that, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm going to tell you basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this down here just to let you know where sort of the uh, uh, you can keep score in this. So first, I'm going to talk about the title, and I'm going to do this in little short stories because that's the way the talk got put together, and I decided it would be best to leave it that way. Now, unfortunately, it makes the transitions between little short stories a little awkward in places, but you'll understand when I get there. Uh, next, after those short stories, which will take a little bit of time because I've got quite a bit of material to cover here, I'm going to talk very briefly about quantum mechanics. And uh, of course, uh, with Dr. Goswami with us today, you, that should be not too much of a surprise. You're going to get quite a bit of that showing up. Now, the third item is the real reason you came to this talk. I'm going to talk about quantum mechanics of high temperature superconductors. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> huh? And. Uh, so I, uh, you know, okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then the last thing, I'm going to close with a metaphor, metaphorical story, actually. And I started out by, actually I was telling Steve this before I came up here, uh, I'm doing a metaphor right now. Because you'll notice I'm not using PowerPoint. I'm <laughs> here's a man after my heart. Yeah, isn't that boring? You know, PowerPoint zombieism. Yeah, uh, students used to, used to turn on the PowerPoint. They go oh, like that, you know. And well, I should, no, I've gone back to overheads uh, before I quit. Then there's the whiteboards and things, electronic blackboards. Um, power, uh, with overheads, you can sh slip things around, and people have to stay alert. But PowerPoint, is, of course, is certainly modern technology. I'm using, using a piece of ancient technology. So that's my metaphor. My p metaphor is that I can use ancient technology to convey modern concepts. And so, I, see, when I thought of that, I thought, this is brilliant. But now, <laughs> well, now that I'm standing here, I think it's stupid, but you know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, that's, that's the idea for using, and I, plus, I like overheads. I just like to use overhead projectors. So that's the whole reason for it. OK, th so there's my talk, uh, and we'll get started. Now, you should have on your chair an outline. I'm sorry, a, uh, a, a two-page, actually, it's one page with two sides to it, of a, uh, a books. And I'd first like to just call your attention, and I see Marina's here, so I'll make sure I get the plug in right away. Were you pleasantly surprised to see this? Yes. Uh, I don't know how many of you, when you get your Quest magazine journal, you take a look at it. I, I hope you read it through and through. But uh, 
I thought I had my, oh yes, here's my copy up here. I suspect you all know that frequently we have a page in there of related resources. And in this issue, uh, the uh, spring issue, it's got this beautiful, in case you don't recognize it, let me flash it before your eyes. Uh, it's very appropriate that we had this listing given. And I would like to pay a special attention to this because all too often I think people just sort of move on beyond because they look at this and say, oh, I don't, I don't know what these are. I go down to Borders and I see this, all these books on the shelves and it doesn't look anything like this. That's the point. That's the point. We have all these books in our library that are unique, especially for science and theosophy. So take a look at these. These are uh, uh, some things that you won't find at Borders. You know, that's, they're, they're just not run of the mill. So I don't know how much time and effort goes into putting this together, but I just want to make sure that we, we call this to your attention. Now, I am going to mention one book in here later, just a few minutes, but uh, uh, keep this handy. Now, on the other side, you have just a few books. This is my list that I started. I had origi originally intended to talk about how to generate a good reading list. But I found out it was too time consuming. I couldn't, they only gave me 45 minutes to do this. I expected the whole morning, you know. So in 45 minutes, I can't do everything. So I'm going to have to, I abbreviated the list. And what you got is basically what I'm confined to. So I will go through this also in just a few minutes. Now, I want to begin with a little history. So give me a moment to, this is one of my transitions. And I've got a date on here. Remember I told you I had a folder, and I wanted to put this talk together, and I wanted to talk about modern science. Now, I know this one says modern science and ancient history, or ancient wisdom. But this is the title of a seminar report, and you can see it's done a long time ago, November 4th and 5th, in 1983. Now, I was just a young man back then. But I was there for that weekend seminar that we put together. And as I was looking in my folder and I ran across this, I thought, oh my gosh, this is still the same thing we're talking about today that we talked about then. And we spent a whole weekend on this concept of sacred science and other things. So I'm going to try to condense a little of that history into a few pointed statements. And then we're going to move on. Now, I brought with me what I had in my folder. This is, this is back in the days when Quest was not Quest. It was called the American Theosophist. And I know that a lot of you say, oh, yes, I remember that. It was a smaller journal. And um, uh, there were three speakers that, the, uh, that weekend. It was actually started the day before the weekend uh, seminar. And that's back when Dora Kuntz was our president. And, uh, they were the uh, primary speakers. I had a m even more important job. I took notes. And then, to make it even worse, I had to write it up. And so this is the write-up that Scott Miners and I, Scott was the editor of the AT at that time, and we published this. And I'm going to pull out of this a couple of points. And I hope that you realize these are points to think about. And uh, if nothing else, you know, from this morning on, besides the lame jokes, you can take away these points that I'm about to present here. OK, there were three major speakers that we had at that uh, weekend seminar. One speaker never really followed through too much after that with the Theosophical Society, Dr. Roger Jones. I liked him because he was my age. He was doing about the same thing I was doing. However, he had just written a successful book. I wrote textbooks, which sort of die after a few years, you know. He wrote a book called Physics as Metaphor. How many of you remember that book? Any, any, oh, dear. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. My plant. My plant. Oh. Yeah, my, she's from Minnesota, too. That's where he was, of course. Uh, he has retired also. He taught 31 years and retired. I taught 31 years and retired. So we had a lot in common. That particular weekend, he uh, was working on a lot of uh, videos that he was trying to put together. 
And he later published another book that was quite successful, and um, I think it's called Physics for Everybody or something of that nature. I lost my notes already on this. Here we go. Physics, Physics for the Rest of Us, that was the title of it. Also very successful, so he did well. He did well. Now, however, he said something that really grabbed me. In fact, I remember right, taking notes. Of, by the way, at that time, the auditorium faced this way. And I was sitting in the back, back there, writing these things down, because that was my job. And he said something, and I remember stopping. And I thought, did he really say that? And this is what he said. Fortunately, uh, this is, we, we caught it on tape. This is what he said. I'll read this. Science has become idolatrous. Oh my, yes. It has set itself up as a model and then has begun to believe in itself. So you see, at the time of this seminar, Fritz Joff Capra had written his famous book, The Tao of Physics, and it had taken off like wildfire. We, in fact, we had Capra here for a weekend seminar. And at that, up to that moment, it was one of the biggest uh, seminars ever held at Alcott. I'm sure it's been surpassed then, but it was a very large seminar. And science was grabbing everything, and especially people like us who thought that suddenly we had, had we are told in the Mahatma letters, of course, that science is our most important ally. So that seemed very fitting to people in the society. And then he comes along and makes this statement right here. Well, I was a little surprised, but after I got to thinking about it and I heard the discussion, I decided I shouldn't be because, in fact, we were setting, it, setting ourselves up possibly for a fall. And so much of the seminar revolved around that concept. He also said one other thing. Aren't you glad I got overhead so you can write this down? It takes time to write this down. See, if I had a PowerPoint, I'd be gone and you'd be, be what do you say, what do you say? OK, recently we have seen a, seen a trend attempting to bring consciousness back into the picture, as in the ancient science. But in spite of this recent interest, reductionism still predominates. That was the problem then, and I'm afraid it's still quite a bit of a problem today. That is one of the things in science that I still see, even though I'm out of the game, research game, I still see that. It's a reductionistic aspect versus consciousness still out there. But I think the society has done a lot to keep consciousness in the game. And I think Dr. Goswami and his work has helped us with that. OK, that's what he said. And I thought, isn't this interesting? Over, over 25 years, we still got the same kind of problem and situation. Keep consciousness in mind because we'll sort of end the whole morning with that. OK, I see I already have to speed up here. Pardon me if I talk twice as fast now. Dr. Ravi Ravindra is, was also there that weekend. How many of you have ever heard of Dr. Uh, all right, good, good. Uh, he was, I got to know him as well, very well that weekend, especially that weekend. And I've always liked what he said. He and I had a few disagreements on things, but it was more in concept. And I thought he, was a, he had just very good original ideas. And in fact, now, this is the moment you've been waiting for, so you can look at this right here. You'll notice the first book I've got on the top right here is his book, which I just fell in love with, called Science and the Sacred, again spelled correctly. And it's a quest book, so you can all rush over to the bookstore as soon as, oh, don't not, you gotta wait till I finish before you go right, rush over to the bookstore and buy his book. And it looks like this. I did have a, here it is. Science and the Sacred, and the subtitle is Eternal Wisdom in a Changing World. So when I started putting this talk together, I of course thought of Robbie's book. And one of the things I thought of, ha ha, piece of cake. Nothing but a book review of this book, and I've got the talk all put together. Well, of course, that didn't work out either, but I would highly recommend this book. It's a little uneven because he does a lot more than science. He does some other things in this, but I don't care. It's, it's a very good book, and uh, if you get 80% of the things in here that you like, it's well worth the price. All right, so what did he have to say? Well, he was with Roger Jones. He was kind of beating up on us as well, so let me show you some of the things he said. He said, he suggested that the ancient wisdom was not so much its content, but rather one's attitude or stance in the world. Now, this is going to come out because we were talking about the sacred. 
and he was talking about the attitude of things. And I'll be coming back to that. Now, um, I'll kind of leave that because I see some people are still writing over there. So let me, the third person, Dr. Rene Weber. There's a name that I haven't heard around here for a little bit. How many of you know Rene? OK, good, good. Again, I'm not talking to an empty house here. Uh, Rene was a very important friend of mine. She is long retired as well. She was at Rutgers, philosophy professor. And she was just full of unique and clever things. And on your sheet right here from the library, the first book at the top is a book that I think is just a classic. And if you do not have that book, that's another book that you should rush over to the library and buy, Dialogues with Science, Scientists and Sages. And uh, if you haven't read it, you're missing, there's a little gap in your life that you're, you need to fill in before you expire. OK, so what did she say? I'm going to take this off now. So she said, Something that also was terribly important in this science seminar that I copied down. Bohm states, the famous David Bohm, who's very also well quoted frequently in the Theosophical Society. Bohm states that these scientists interpret their world as demonstrating the laws of matter, but they do not know what matter is. That was his whole point. See, the reductionistic aspect was matter, the Newtonian concept. But they didn't know what matter was. Where does consciousness fit in? So there we have it, sort of in a nutshell. I probably stopped here and I made my point. We've got the matter, the concept of Newtonian mechanics. Consciousness, where do we get consciousness? Where does that work in the science? Well, of course, most of you read other things and you know that's where the quantum mechanics is helping us out. And that's where I'm going to be going to. So we have these three speakers. Let's see. Did I Oh, I got one other thing. Let me put that up here, too. Her punchline. They do not understand that matter is influenced by consciousness. And Dr. Goswami, I think, certainly has helped carry this on for us in the society. So we roughly are where we are a little over 25 years ago, I think, in our thinking. But I think we're slowly crawling and creeping our way up the ledge, trying to make our point, and eventually uh, someone's going to make it big time. OK, so there's my uh, little history of what's going on. Now I come to just some statements. And um, these are, again, designed to shock you, to keep, keep you mad, I guess, if, you know, get the, get the juices going here. So I picked the first one, once again, from Ravi. Does science have any spiritual significance? He raised and poised that question. I don't know whether he actually did it at that weekend seminar or not. I happened to write it down and give him the quote. But I, I thought that was a profound question. I mean, maybe science doesn't have any spiritual significance. I don't believe that for a moment, but I know plenty of scientists that do. And they're the majority. And they get all the grant money. So you know, I'm sort of in the minority aspect. There. But it's an important thing to keep in front of you. Also, after this was stated, somewhere along in that weekend, and I actually think it was downstairs in our library, probably on a uh, Thursday night, we were sitting around the fireplace down there, and Ravi sort of challenged us to put in writing some of our innermost feelings about this. And now this happens, to, oh I, gosh, uh, <clears throat> another, I, another typo. <laughs> uh, this is copyrighted by me. <laughs> you may not use it unless you pay me lots of money. I expect, and this is what I came up with. I expect and believe that modern science and ancient spiritual traditions will be integrated into some higher synthesis. Some of you might suspect something right there. I was reading a lot of Sri Aurobindo at that time, who 
talks this way and talks a lot about that. So I, I was heavily influenced by the way I wrote that. But I still stand by that statement. I found this statement as, as I was preparing for this talk. And I thought, this is as good as anything I'm going to say all morning, so I might as well throw this one in as well. It's thrown in for free. So that was another thing that sort of somehow came out of that uh, weekend workshop. OK, I've been talking about stuff over 25 years old. And we're still there today. We're still talking about the same thing. Have you noticed I'm not talking about anything new? It's all old? We noticed. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like me. It's just like me. Young lady up here. And we love it. Oh, yeah, right. Well, in doing this, however, I had an alternative title for the talk because I'm not talking about anything new. In fact, Miss Smarty Pants. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing new by nobody special. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> have you ever heard this before? Yes. Have, have you heard this before? This happens to be a rather famous book touring title. And I was hoping Dr. Goswami might be here, because he actually interviewed back in 1980 the person that did this book tour. You reckon, most of you will recognize the name. Oh. Ram Das. Ram Das did a book tour. That was the title of his book tour. Nothing new by nobody special. And uh, roughly around that time, Dr. Goswami did an interview with uh, Ram Das. And it's still, I still have that cassette tape uh, at home. I only got two cassette tape players left that still work. And I can still listen to it. And in fact, I listened to it before, uh, before I came over. So, so we've got all these things that we're still talking about, that I'm still talking about. And I know that they're still out there and other people are talking about it. So where do we go from here? Well, I go back to Ravi's uh, brain. And here's something he said I thought was terribly significant. Any theory is better than no theory. Any theory is better than no theory. And so what he was, what he was getting at here was the fact that sometimes the scientists who are reductionist don't like the scientists who like to bring in consciousness. And when we try to do that, they say, but there's no proof. There's no way to experimentally verify this. You, where there's not even any theory out there. Robbie is pointing out that, in fact, if we can generate and create a theory, at least it's a beginning. So no, any theory is better than no theory. And I'm going to generate one just in a few minutes. So um, the last thing that Robbie said that really fried my brain was this. One should not let oneself be seduced by, a superficial, by superficial parallels between the certain expressions and paradoxes of contemporary science and ancient oriental thought. He was saying this in direct sort of refutation of Capra's book, because everyone had latched on to Capra's book so much that Raleigh was just thinking that everyone had gotten onto a modern fad. You might remember that was the last part of my title of my talk. And so his, this was his way of saying, let's not go there. It's just we're just going to one extreme too much. And people say, oh, no, no, no. We got, the science is much too important. We've got to bring all this in. Well, I think he was right. Here we are 25 years later, and I think we are seeing the modern fad. Let me um, joke alert, joke alert, wake up. Harry Bliss is wonderful. Some of you in the Chicago area might remember this. It was in the Trib. Two ladies here, and one's kind of pulling back. You can't see it lost a little bit in the reproduction of, on the uh, overhead. She's kind of pulling back her wrinkles up here, you know, like that. And she's saying to the other lady, I can Botox it, but I don't want it to freeze up my sixth <laughs> chakra. <laughs> Would you agree that's a modern fan? 
maybe we've taken it a little bit too far. Okay, now let's talk about some of these modern fads. Now the first one's not going to be funny because I don't think it's a modern fad, but I would like to tell you because I talk to scientific people and they think it's a bunch of baloney. You've heard of therapeutic touch, I believe, right? Worked with Dora Kuntz. In fact, I would like to say that I was here working with Dora when she was in those informative years. I remember meeting with Dolores Krieger, uh, Dr. Car Caraguma? Car yes, Caragula, yes. And uh, looking at some of the illustrations that eventually got into her book, or their book, and uh, just knowing the integrity of Dora, I never had any doubt in my mind that uh, something was going on here. But to talk to a scientist about this, and of course, they, oh, gee, my name, I said, yeah, well. it's just like a chiropractor. You know, they didn't believe in chiropractors until they were walking around like this, and then they <laughs> walked in, they came out strutting around like this. You know? <laughs> oh, that guy was great, man. <laughs> well, the same thing, same thing made with the therapeutic touch. And so once upon a time, I, in fact, generated on the spot a theory. Uh, to a scientist, so this is what Ravi, I think, meant when he said uh, no theory, uh, a theory is better than no theory. And I generated this theory, I said, well, you're a scientist, let's, we, uh, we have uh, nerves in our body and electrons move up and down these uh, nerves. And we know, after all, that movement of electrons, we have a fancy name for it, we call it electricity, isn't that amazing? So we have electricity emanating from our body. Let's just say that some people are a little more sensitive to that. I don't know how, but let's just say it's sort of a given that some people are sensitive. And maybe their hands can somehow sense that sensitivity. And let's call this electrical body, let's say, well, oh, let's give it a name maybe. How about etheric body? Is that etheric body, is that okay? They never know that I'm talking theosophy to them, you see. They say, oh, yeah, okay. I say, well, now I imagine some people can sense that. And so there's a theory. So you can generate right there in the spot, whether they bought it or not, I have no idea, but it seemed to satisfy certain things. So that's, that's where that led to. However, sometimes I think the modern fad can creep into the story here. And I, um, there are two things that I really have now started enjoying. I'm 68 years old. And when you get a little old, certain things in your body, I, I have a structural defect. And so it's starting to show up a little bit. So there are two things I really enjoy in life now. One is yoga. That's really helped me a lot. And the other is massage therapy. And I, I won't give either one of them up. I can tell you that right now. So I sort of keep up with what's going on here. And every once in a while, something funny, the modern fad business, oh my, look at the time. You don't mind if we go maybe an hour and a half over, do you? <laughs> I may have to cut high temperature superconductors out, you know? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quantum touch, quantum touch, quantum touch. Now, when I first saw this, because my massage therapist's name is Kendra and she has really healing hands. And she went to the workshops and learned how to do all this. And she also does Reiki and you know, she's very versatile. And if she says, I think I should do this to improve that banged up knee you've got there, that's, I say, just fine, do your thing. She's talking about this quantum touch. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, quantum, she's going to do some quantum mechanics on me. <laughs> you know, I, I th thought maybe I'd better ask her to explain what, just what she had in mind. But it turned out that this is just a name that they gave to a particular technique. And I think quantum touch is kind of catchy, right? So I think it was a marketing ploy. Uh, it's more working with Marie and of the body, and she does some things like that. So there's nothing out of the ordinary, almost a little Tai Chi in a sense. So you can put a name quantum on something, but it's just a marketing ploy. Um, here's another one. Yoga Rhythmics. Now this has been around for quite a long time. If you go to their uh, website today, they say a little light yoga and a little light dance. And that makes sense. However, when it first came out, and by the way, I have the ad up here. I won't bother digging it out because I'm running short on time. Their ad says, by the way, am I, when am I supposed to stop? 10 o'clock? And then we're supposed to have some time for questions. Who's in charge here? 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. However okay. you okay. want to do it, but you have an hour. Okay, maybe no questions. Just <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> if you read the ad that went along with this, this is what they said, a quantum workout for body, mind, and spirit. And I thought, a quantum, okay, little electrons dance around. <laughs> Are you a particle or are you a wave? You know? ah. I did not know. I did not know what it meant. And so I had to go to the website to find out, and it's gone. They don't, she doesn't talk about that now. But it may be, I, I'm sure it's quite legitimate because it's still around. It's been going for a number of years. So there must be something there. A little light yoga and a little light dance is a little more descriptive. But the name again, uh, had, the description had a quantum workout. So I think she marketed the name. Here's one called, I told you that I like to do yoga now, Quantum Yoga. And I put this name right here because I at one time had this book. I couldn't find it to dig out to bring with me, so uh, I just put her name up here. And this is what she says in her Quantum Yoga. Now, I've done enough yoga for enough years, but I was a little perplexed where quantum mechanics came into this, but this is what she said. It's finding a kinship between yoga, philosophy, and quantum physics. And she focuses on prana. OK, I'm with that now. Prana, oh, that's not a problem, which is our life force. Consciousness, ah, he's after my heart. And the transcendent goals of yoga. OK, I'm with all of that. It's just that the name, that the quantum part got in there. I don't see where it fits in. And I don't remember from the book how she did that. I have a feeling she just kind of worked it in as a marketing ploy. I'm just throwing that out, and I'm sure that she's got a good program because it's been around and still surviving. But you're all clever enough and smart enough that you know you don't get, you you don't go to your class and then go out and think you can teach quantum mechanics or something. You know that you just know that's in a name. You're not swindled. Uh, three weeks ago, I added this one to my list. I had to make an over, overhead. Uh, you've got these free booklets over at the bookstore, and I just happened to see this and tore it out and added it. <clears throat> the Quantum Matrix <clears throat> Center. It's a place somewhere north of here, I believe. And uh, I looked it up on the web. It's just kind of a big place where you can do a lot of spiritual things. And apparently, once again, the name Quantum, I think, just got put in the title as sort of a marketing ploy. So these are the modern fads that, and I don't, I, I could go on and on and on. Just go to the bookstore and look at how many books over there have quantum in their titles. Google it on uh, your computer, and you know you spend the rest of the week uh, <laughs> checking some of those things out. So it's really out there. It, it has sort of become a fad, and I, I'm not probably telling you anything new right here. But at the same time, I think sometimes we do have to be a little bit careful. Now, because of time, um, I decided I want to go home. <laughs> I'm going to, pardon me while I uh, shift a few things around here. I could show you these lame jokes, but yeah, I might as well show you these. These are lame jokes. I was going to talk about high temperature superconductors. I, that, that may get sidetracked. I may shorten it down from uh, 50 minutes to two seconds. But here's, um, here's some things on quantum mechanics. Uh, many of you, how many are, are from this area? You know, roughly this area. OK, lot, OK. Lot. There are two major science attractions in this area that I'm, that I'm used to. One is the Fermi National Laboratory. I don't, I've never worked there. I've only been there for conferences and things. The other is Argonne National Laboratory, which is the federal lab, not terribly far from here. That's where I have done quite a bit of my research. So people sometimes get me confused. They think, uh, they hear Argonne, they think that I accelerate particles or something uh, of that nature. And that's, that's not true. That's just not part of me. On the other hand, and because it's very hard to come up with jokes on, uh, on this, I have one here which may, you may or may not find funny. But I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> it's a man right here. He's got his hat over something on the sidewalk, you can see. And his wife is saying something to him that says, oh, please, Edward, don't embarrass yourself again. The last time you were absolutely sure you captured a quark, and it turned out just to be a pie maison. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, a little quantum mechanics. A little more joking here because uh, I have two things on quantum mechanics. One is high temperature superconductors, which I see is going to get shortchanged. But the other is um, a short little lecture on quantum mechanics, which is going to be bi very biased because it's going to lead me into my closing <laughs> statements, which are rapidly approaching. A little quantum mechanics. Let's see. What I'm, it's a 1015, right? Right, Steve? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I thought I'd start out with a, I didn't have that joke at that time, but I found it later, so I had to come up with some joke. And this is a verbal thing that I've got up here. Let me explain briefly. How many of you have heard of uh, Bell's theory? John Bell. Okay, enough people in here. Uh, two particles separated, and if one of them flips the spin, the other will flip it immediately with no time taken for that to happen. It's an instantaneous thing, which technically can happen because that means the particles travel faster than speed of light to transfer the information. He was the one that concocted that, very famous thing. What a lot of people don't know about John Bell is that he, he was a, he was a, besides being a very brilliant person, he was kind of a renegade in science. He was a theoretician too. Theoreticians are always renegades. They, you know, they, they think up crazy things, whereas experimentalists like me were pretty mundane and everyday sort of folks. He would do things that no other scientist would do. For example, back in the 80s, he would go to the um, place in Fairfield, uh, Iowa, Maharishi, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he would go out there to their science thing and participate in it. And for most people, that would have been, for scientists, that would have been the kiss of death. You go there once and you're dead. You <laughs> never get a paper accepted again. He didn't care. He's fairly famous. He got there. And uh, you know why he went there? Among other reasons. He said they had the best vegetarian food ever. Because <laughs> he was a vegetarian. And a lot of people don't know that. And uh, so that's why he'd go. And he'd go and anyway, he made a very funny statement. One of the scientists there asked him, um, and in fact, this is a quote that I've got here. It said, I once asked John Bell what he thought the problem was with quantum theory, or what the problem was. He laughed, and he said that if he knew, he might make some progress <laughs> towards solving it. <laughs> so he realized, he realized that quantum mechanics just wasn't there yet in terms of answering everything, this consciousness factor that we're still wrestling with. And Dr. Goswami is going to clear it all up this afternoon, I'm sure. Ha ha ha. But it's still going to be with us. And until we clear that up and find out how quantum mechanics gets into this argument, uh, it's still going to be hanging out there blowing in the wind. All right, now I've got a few things here that I'm going to reduce this to one. How many of you have are familiar, or at least heard of, the um, famous Erwin Schrodinger conundrum where there's a cat in the box, and we don't know if the cat's dead or alive until we open the box and look at it. How many of you have heard? Oh, good. Would someone kind of come up and explain this to me? <laughs> <laughs> most people uh, have heard of it. And most people are still kind of out there in left field as to what it really means. I was going to uh, use Dr. Goswami's book here, which you'll notice I've cited two, uh, The Self-Aware Universe and uh, The Visionary Window. Either one of those books will do a good job. The Visionary Window is probably my favorite book because it covers the whole broad spectrum. It has a nice discussion, but the one above it is really the, the best one that I've seen on this whole total explanation. I'd like to give a very uh, abbreviated version of it. So uh, if nothing else, you'll leave here at least knowing what it's about and what it's really trying to say because that's what most people miss. They keep thinking about waves and particles and dead on alive cats, which I think is just an awful thing to talk about at a theosophical meeting anyway. So let me try to clear all of this up. The interpretation of the cat is really what we, if you take a course in quantum mechanics, it's really what we call the Copenhagen interpretation. That's because back in Copenhagen, this is when the Niels Bohr and Franz were trying to put this into perspective, and there were two opposing viewpoints of all of this, and so uh, they were very famous for coming up with, uh, with sort of philosophical explanations of what's going on here. So th this quantum cat is really the Copenhagen school. That quite often is left off because that's so, that's so old, you know, like 90 years ago. And this is what the Copenhagen school says and in a brief sort of way, very brief. Uh, we have elementary particles, which I'm going to use from here, here on out just call the microscopic. These are subatomic type particles like quarks and pi mesons. 
and they remain in multiple states until they are measured. And in our case, in the CAT state, we say until it's observed. All right, so that's a measurement, our observation. Okay, armed with that, all that quantum mechanical knowledge. But then came things, but can the same, there we go, oh, there's my typo. I, 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 I was gonna see if you said it and then I, it's your, can the same thing and I, can the cane thing, take your pick, doesn't matter. Can the same thing be said of macroscopic objects like rocks? Can, can they also exhibit quantum mechanical behavior? Uh, this pin, can this pin exhibit quantum mechanical behavior? Uh, and of course, cats, can cats exhibit quantum mechanical behavior? That was the whole concern. Where does it lose quantum mechanicalness and become non-quantum mechanicalness? That's the purpose of this cat experiment. And so, Erwin Schrodinger thought not. He thought that you better be careful of that transition. There's a transition someplace, and you better be careful where that transition occurs. Hence, the cat made its appearance in his famous argument. And I'd like to quickly go through that argument now, because number one, time's running out. So here's our story. For those of you that don't know this, we've got a box. I like to call it the cat and the hat approach. We've got a cat, a box, a poison, poison vial, and a hammer triggered by a decaying particle, which is a random event. Radioactive decay is a random event. It's measured by probability, not by exactness. You only talk about the probability of it happening in a certain period of time. So we got this poor cat in that box. There's a hammer here, and the radioactive decaying particle is going to trigger the hammer to come down, hit the vial, break it open, and the gas is going to be released. And so the cat will, will die. Again, terrible theosophical. Uh, I'm so embarrassed. Okay, so we close the box until probability says there's a 50-50 chance, right, 50-50 chance, that the particle has decayed, which will be detected by a Geiger counter. Pretty st now things get weird. This is the part where everyone sort of fades away. The Copenhagen interpretation, notice I accented that twice now, tells us that the particle exists in a state of simultaneous decay and no decay. Now, I made that last one up. <laughs> you know, it's either decayed or it hasn't decayed, but I call it no decay. So there's one of two states. It's a, remember, it's a 50-50 chance. So either the hammer's come down with the vial or it hasn't. It's either decayed or it hasn't decayed until the box is open and absurd. We don't know. We just don't know until we open the box and look. Now, remember. The cat's fate is tied directly to the state of the particle. The particle is decaying. So we have a simultaneous live and dead cat. Now that was Erwin Schrodinger's point. If quantum mechanics applies to large objects like cats, we have a cat in a hat. We have this cat that's both dead and alive. That's the weird part. But the question is, he was trying to raise, can we really project it up to those large objects rather than they keep it down in the quarks and pi meson? Well, the question, as I've already kind of implied here, do the laws of quantum mechanics hold true when you scale them up from the micro to the macro? They don't. Otherwise, I would put my hand on the chair, and if I were living in a quantum mechanical world, I could run right on through the chair. But we know that's not going to happen because we are scaled up high enough that the laws of quantum mechanics don't play a major factor when I reach the back of this chair. But what happens in my brain, for example? What happens with consciousness? And the answer is, I don't know. And we're still working on that. That's what quantum mechanics is trying to help us with today. That's why it's still such a conundrum. So the question is, where does that transition point occur? And if we could actually answer that, we probably could make great progress toward what consciousness is. And that's what people in quantum mechanics are trying to do. And uh, it's a very, very difficult topic, to say the least. As you saw, we've been working on this for over 25 years at the Society, and we're not much closer. Yes? First question that hits my mind is, what makes us think 
Well, that's what Irwin Schrodinger was asking too. Is it fixed or is it a gradual transition or what? I don't know the answer to that, and I, I can't really tell you. What? Oh, he was actually at asking what, how, why do we think there is actually a transition point? Why does it have to be a transition point? And what I was going to show you, which I don't have time, what I was going to show you was a science experiment that I worked on for roughly 13 years called high temperature su to superconductors. And it showed us where the transition point occurred where things were normal conductors and, and had no resistance, the electron would move forever with no resistance. There's a very sharp transition point there. And if we understood quantum mechanics, we would be able to explain that transition point. If we could explain that transition point, then we could make progress, probably either maybe answering your question, is there is there not transition point for conscious? We, we don't know. That wasn't the nature of my question. I was suggesting the possibility Probabilistic event. So, in different instances, it would occur in different places. See, right there's your there's any theory is better than no theory, right? <laughs> any theory is better than no theory. His theory is just as good as anyone or his question. We don't we just don't know. I mean, he's raising valid point. These are the points that are going to be raised. I don't know the answer. No one knows the answer. Just write your paper and publish it and become famous, <laughs> famous or. -er. Um, so I was going to spend a little bit of time on this. Obviously, I'm not. See if I've got, uh, I did have one show and tell here. I don't know, know what I did with it. If I can't find it, I won't even show you my show and tell. But uh, did anybody see a little vial? I had a little vial. Maybe I put it in my pocket. No, it's not even in my pocket. I don't know where it is. Oh, yes, here it is. It's in my pocket. <laughs> Uh, in trying to make a high temperature superconductor, uh, you do this in a lab, of course. Now I want to make reference to scary science or sacred science. Here's a picture of me in, uh, this, in the, uh, in the uh, lab, in my lab coat. <laughs> Actually, I had the perfect dream. I was like an alchemist. I was doing the same thing the alchemist where I was taking uh, compounds, chemical compounds, mixing them together, heating them up, uh, turning them into something else. Actually, could turn them into a ceramic, which when you cool down became a conductor of electricity. Ceramics are mainly insulators. But when you cool them down, they became not only conductor of electricity, they became super conducting. That is, they lost all resistivity. And it, actually, this, this is not me, of course. You, Notice that I don't have a beard. That's an alchemist <laughs> brewing tea, in case you really wonder what that was. But I have here, I have here, I wanted to show you what, what this looks like. Uh, this is the only one I, I have, but you, I see you really want to see that. Uh, that's, that's what something looks like. And this is the sacredness part. Because when I made that, and tested it, and it was a superconductor, I realized that, you know, that was the only one in the world ever made. And I made that. Did all the stoichiometric calculations, did all the grinding and the furnace work. It took me about two weeks. Take out the furnace, and you test it, and it's real. And it's just like the alchemist feeling, I bet, when they turn lead into gold, you know? Or the stupid ones, the gold and the lead. Yeah. <laughs> You hold it in your hands, and you just got this precious, sacred thing. And you just feel so, such a sacred feeling. That, that's where I think the attitude that Ravi was coming from when he made that statement, way back at the very beginning. It's an attitude kind of thing. You get the sacredness. OK, now, um, since I'm about to run out of time here, we, that's all I'm going to tell you about high temperature superconductors. And I could have addressed that transition point a little bit clearer. You want to keep that or give it back? Thank you. I'll put it back in my pocket. Um, I want to actually close right now. This is I will close, and so everyone can go get coffee. Uh, I was going to talk about transitions because I think as scientists we have to make a transition. Uh, we have to somehow get out of the reductionism frame of mode, which is going to be very hard because we live in a Newtonian mechanics world, 
into a quantum mechanical world, or at least start thinking that way, so we can deal with quantum mechanics and consciousness. In the society, we've been trying to do that for a long time, but I think the rest of the world has to catch up with us, and uh, who knows who knows how it's going to work out. I don't think I'm going to be here when it eventually works out. I don't think most of us are going to be here. So I'm going to close with a metaphor. And this metaphor is actually, I know I realized that uh, I have two books here that I haven't mentioned. I guess I should mention Shirley Nicholson's book. She does a very good job as well on ancient wisdom, modern insight. Um, I just love this book. It's, a, again, a good, it's a little outdated, but boy, is it good. Uh, for what it's worth, I know they used to have it at the bookstore. I have two more books that is on your list there. And uh, this is a, a little off of theosophy. The first one's by Jacob Needleman called Lost Christianity. Uh, those of you that are familiar with Jacob Needleman, he's more a Gurdjieff person. But he wrote this book, which is really a classic, and it's sort of how Christianity became organized and lost the wisdom aspect, an institution and lost the wisdom. That's what he talks about in this book, Lost Christianity. This is long out in paperback now, so um, you can get it cheaper than what I pay for it. There is a modern person out there, her name is Cynthia Bouget, and that's, I believe, the last, yeah, um, down toward the bottom. She um, is, is a, a character in herself. She's a hermit. She's an Episcopalian priest. She's done most of her training at Catholic monasteries. Um, and she writes things about uh, wisdom, tradition, and Christianity. And she took a story that Jacob Needleman had and put it in her book, which is the last one listed, uh, The Wisdom Way of Knowing, that's on your list right there. Uh, this is, again, something picking up that's very theosophical in nature. You'll understand. I don't have time to dwell on this. But she's taken this story that he told and brought it up to date. <clears throat> well, in honor of this talk, I've taken her story and I've updated it some more for this audience. So you're welcome. <laughs> it's simply called the acorn. Now, like all metaphors, it just ends. So you have to be the one out there to see how to apply it to your life. But I'll try to get you through some of the rough spots. Remember now we're talking about making a transition in our life, whether it's in the thought process, reductionism, consciousness, whatever. It's made about making a transition. OK, it's called the acorn. And like all good stories, it begins out once upon a time. Once upon a time, there's the kingdom of acorns. They were nestled at the foot of a grand oak tree. Now, since the citizens of this kingdom were modern, fully westernized acorns, they went about their business with focused energy and considered themselves to be very spiritual. Oh, you're saying, is this about me? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Now, since most of them were midlife baby boomer acorns, <laughs> they tended to indulge, engage in a lot of self-help courses, weekend workshops, summer national gatherings. <laughs> For example, they had one weekend workshop called Getting All You Can Out of Your Shell. <laughs> well, there were wounded and recovery groups of acorns who had been bruised in their original fall from the tree. <laughs> Little play on words on original fall in case you didn't notice it's in italics. <laughs> and there were spas for oiling and polishing those shells and other various therapies to enhance longevity and well-being. Added commentary from me. I suspect there were also some acorn yoga classes, too. <laughs> well, one day in the midst of this kingdom, there suddenly appeared an awkward little stranger 
apparently dropped out of the blue by a passing bird. Think about that for a moment. He was capless and dirty, and he was making an immediate negative impression on his fellow acorns. And beneath the big old tree, he stammered out a wild tale. He pointed up at the big oak tree, and he said, we are that. <laughs> Crazy little booger. Well, <clears throat> one of the highly polished acorns said, so <clears throat> tell us, <laughs> how, do we, how do we little acorns become that tree? Well, the scuffy acorn said, that's the esoteric part. <laughs> First you join the Theosophical Society. <laughs> Now, uh, <clears throat> I wasn't a member that long, long enough to learn all of the secrets. But it has to do with going into the ground and breaking open our shell. And at that point, the other acorns simply stopped listening because they knew if they did that, they would no longer be acorns. Thank you very much.